Let me welcome everybody who's starting to uh, enter the room. Um, this is uh, Dr. Craig Liebenson. This is our eighth uh, webinar in this series about high value musculoskeletal uh, prehab and rehab, the telehealth challenge. Uh, this is a very, very special one. I have two guests with me uh, today. Second time we've uh, tried to negotiate with two guests. Um, Paula Silva from the University of Cincinnati and Matthew Lowe from England. I want to welcome both of you uh, to our to our room, to our to our community. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you for having us. <laughs> and uh, of course, I'm as always joined uh, from New York City by uh, my uh, great friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Ryan Chow. Hi, everybody. Glad to be back with you guys. Excited for today. And as am I. And also, um, uh, Aaron Kubal is here from Minnesota. Aaron, uh, former baseball player, soon to be chiropractor, still in school, um, with uh, Geronimo Bejarano from, uh, from Colombia. Uh, but out of Florida where he's also going to chiropractic school. These two students um, uh, fr from uh, their respective uh, schools uh, had the bright idea that they would imprison me for the last two months during COVID and uh, get me to do these webinars for everybody. Um, this is our eighth. Uh, there'll be two more after this as we bring back uh, Rachel Balkovec for part two. Uh, and Nick Winkleman uh, for our final 10th uh, webinar for part two of his, of his program. Uh, but I think Aaron's going to go over a couple ground rules right now about questions because uh, we do want to make this an interaction. Go ahead, Aaron. Right on. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, when we get started here, um, as everybody begins their discussion, any questions that come up, there's a Q&A. Uh, section located at the top of your screen. Put any questions you have in there. I know there's a chat function too, but we're not going to be monitoring that for questions. We're only looking for questions in the Q&A. So please put those there and it should be fun. Thanks, guys. I also want to add that uh, anybody who really wants to stay up to speed with um, some of the more challenging questions that we're all faced with uh, as we try to upgrade our mindset in terms of uh, guiding by the side um, and implementing uh, best practices uh, that we've been learning about um, really should follow uh, Geronimo on social media. He's on uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and probably more up to date than 99.9% .9 of people in the field. So uh, students sometimes uh, have an open mind and they're a tabla rosa and they can pave the way and lead the rest of us. So um, we have a couple of working groups that will perpetuate some of the uh, things that we've been discovering and discussing uh, in these programs. But one of the reasons why uh, we started First Principles of Movement is because we realized that there's a lot of evidence and the evidence isn't being put into practice. So there's a gap. And Paolo was just talking about bridging the gap from uh, being, you know, writing a thesis when you're younger to actually trying to research things um, and to put them into practice and to see what uh, you can prove or disprove. And of course, what we've been talking a lot about in these past seven programs is the importance of humility and the importance of having a, a growth mindset where we're trying to test our theories. Um, we're trying to see if they're robust. And it's the same for athletes, it's the same for patients. We'll be talking a lot today about uh, concepts of anti-fragility and how it is that people become fragile and also how we may actually be iatrogenically um, uh, poisoning people with ideas, nocebos, uh, that make them feel fragile. We may be making people overly cognitive, overly protective. Uh, we may be setting people up uh, for feeling they need imaging to find out the cause of their back pain, the holy grail, the cause of their neck or shoulder pain, uh, without really educating people in a way um, that connects with them 
so they understand why it is that there are false positives on these structural images and that those aren't going to help them become uh, uh, functioning human beings again. Um, so the first principles approach is something we resort to uh, as we're starting to build a best practices model. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, with COVID-19, uh, we have controversy about masks. We, we look at the evidence and when there's no RCTs, uh, there aren't even observational studies yet. And we know that the mask is a fomite. So what might seem obvious that you wear the mask to protect you may actually only be appropriate in certain environments. Um, so there are a lot of um, uh, things to, to delve into uh, with respect to our understanding of science and how to apply it. Uh, but I think the biggest issue that we all face in the musculoskeletal space is that we have a disability crisis. We have a, a population that is getting older and older. Um, and tragically and ironically in a way, um, it's not just that we have more disability because we're living longer. A 50-year-old today is biologically older than a 50-year-old was in the 1940s biologically older than a 50-year-old was in the industrial period, biologically older than a cave person was. And we know this from study of the fossils of cave people, uh, the bones of people in the industrial period, and the x-rays of people in the 1940s, and comparing them with our scans of, of people today. Our joints are more arthritic today, and yet we're told that this is a wear and tear syndrome, which is a nocebo, because most people are inactive. We're overweight, which we know uh, is a big risk factor for COVID-19 hospitalization. And we are underactive. So we're, we're eating too much and we're moving too little. And so our biological age and our chronological age are out of sync. Uh, a 50 year old today is like a 60 or 65 year old. So yeah, we're living longer, but our health span our healthy longevity is compromised. And so we have a disability crisis. And the approaches that have been used, most of them very well-meaning, things like manual therapy, cortisone injections, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, orthopedic surgeries, the scans, motor control exercises, corrective exercises, these are all well-meaning approaches. They all have a place, but the benefit to risk ratio is not necessarily um, telling us that these are the highest value approaches. So now we're seeing that in the constraint of social distancing, that a lot of our elective procedures, the injections and the other interventions, the surgeries, the scans, they're off the table. And additionally, the people that we're serving, we're not able to see them in our offices except for urgent care. And so now we're being constrained by telehealth to guide by the side. And lo and behold, what is it that the evidence has always said is the most powerful form of management? It's empowerment. It's teaching people what they can do for themselves. So this has really been the beginning of this journey. And I think today is really going to be one of the pinnacle weekends. Um, and I want to dive in right now. Uh, here are some of my handles. I mentioned you should uh, all follow uh, Geronimo uh, Bejarano, uh, because he's on top of the latest. Um, and you can find him in, in, in most of the different uh, outlets. Here are some of my handles. Uh, you can look at this later also on the YouTube. Um, and I'm just so pleased to have uh, Paula and, and Matt with us, Matt for the second time for our eighth, eighth challenge. I know we're going to learn a lot. Uh, one of the messages that we've been uh, going back to uh, over and over again is this idea from Roderick Henderson about Batman and Alfred and that it's time to uh, guide by the side. It's time to realize uh, what people are capable of and that if we um, fix people, if we correct people, um, they don't learn how to take care of themselves. Uh, but we can create an environment that's safe, uh, that challenges people at the edge of their capability uh, that uses novelty and variability, uh, where the stimulus is sufficient, a sufficient stress to cause adaptation, and this can help people become more robust. 
uh, if we follow these basic principles of reassurance, reactivation, um, uh, uh, robustness uh, to build resilience, uh, and of course, variability and optionality so people can handle the unexpected, so they're anti-fragile. Uh, if we follow these four principles, uh, this uh, is something that we don't need to actually <laughs> be laying hands on people. Laying hands on people is very powerful. So is a cortisone shot. So is a microdiscectomy. Um, but right treatment, right person, right time. And the highest value approaches that have the broadest impact, uh, that are good in lower and higher socioeconomic strata, that are good with athletes from, from pros to average Joes, these follow principles. And these principles apply to everybody. So we've been making the pivot from Batman to Alfred. And there's three areas that, that we've been hearing from you. Our basic um, uh, areas that uh, uh, are not, we're not as comfortable with. We're outside our comfort zone. And this is where the growth is occurring that Rachel Balkovec talked about, where we'll have failures, where, where failure tolerance is the secret to success. And the first is addressing fear avoidance beliefs, which make patients afraid of active care or self-care. And we see this all the time. People who have anxiety, people who have stinking thinking, who cognitively think hurt equals harm or activity is dangerous. Um, they've been told they have a herniated disc or a narrow spinal canal, a torn labrum, a torn rotator cuff, degenerative arthritis, and even worse, unscientific terms. I see every day, I write these things down. I have a deteriorating spine. Um, on bone on bone. Um, these, uh, in many of the people that we care for, uh, these lead to uh, abnormal illness behavior, both from an affective and a cognitive standpoint. And of course, these individuals naturally associate hurt with harm. So their relationship to activity is compromised and they become overprotective. Um, so dealing with this is one of the things that in the course of these webinars, um, that we've been upskilling how you can make that pivot. The second one is addressing patient expectations for manual therapy and or corrective exercise to normalize faulty movement patterns. This is a subject very close to me. I, I studied uh, with one of my great mentors, Professor Vladimir Yanda, bringing him here from Prague, going to Prague after the Berlin Wall fell. And we know that in um, the kinetic chain that there are biomechanically optimal movements, there are uh, technical proficiencies that we wanna see when somebody is under load, um, but what about when they're not under load? And do we have to correct all of the dysfunctions we see or can we prioritize? Um, is there a time and a place? And when the patient is expecting that they get manual therapy or they're expecting that somebody is gonna correct how they move, um, doesn't that in itself make them more fragile? Can we not give them a positive experience with movement so that they feel more confident? And I think this is where self-efficacy is so important, to give people the confidence that they can succeed, to create a safe environment that's relatable, that, that is something which makes sense to them, because it's not just some isolated movement pattern on the floor with bands in some unusual synchrony. Instead, it's something which relates to them. They want to learn. You may have a grandma that wants to babysit and the daughter-in-law says, oh, you have back pain, you can't lift the kids. So you're not gonna be able to help us. Well, how can we help this grandma to be able to bend, to change the, the infant, to be able to carry the infant, to be able to lift the infant um, with more confidence, to not feel like their spine is gonna crumble or that they're fragile, they're about to break. The body is built to last, it's not built to break. So. When we go and fix people, when we have the Batman role, they feel better, but a lot of times it's like a cough drop. How long does it really last? But if we show a person what they can do for themselves, then they really gain that self-efficacy. And finally, there's the healthcare professionals belief themselves um, that, that, that we've found something wrong. Um, so we find all kinds of things on everybody, leg length inequalities, tight, short muscles, faulty movement patterns, 
altered scapial humeral rhythm, head forward posture. The, the list goes on and on. And there are certain defaults that we go back to. Um, looking at the butt wink during the deep squat, um, as an example, looking at the sway back, the fallen subtalar uh, uh, arch uh, with subtalar hyperpronation. And so naturally we see all of this. We have these incredible skills of observation. We have lots of tests. And then there's the desire to, to fix things, um, to correct things, to normalize. And we're not saying that there isn't a role for manual therapy. But as Mackenzie taught, if you really understand the back problem, if somebody has thrown their back out that if you're an expert, you should be able to guide them to put their back back in. Now, that's just a metaphor, but it speaks to this, this third aspect uh, that's been coming up in the Q&As. Um, what is the role of manual therapy? Uh, and what is the role of higher levels of technical proficiency? How much can you really teach a person how to normalize and optimize faulty movement patterns uh, through telehealth? Well, we showed a picture from... Uh, a quote from Rachel Locke, a colleague of ours, uh, one of our faculty in Europe, she's in England. And Rachel said that her patient reported to her with tele telehealth um, that it was surprising um, how personal it was. And I think when you make a connection, and Matt's gonna talk about this, when you make a connection with people, um, your ability to transform them, your ability to give them confidence and empower them uh, goes through the roof. And now you gain that trust because there are ups and downs. So one of the questions that specifically dealt with these three issues was asked by Ash Mokhtar, uh, one of our students. Uh, I've seen a lot of patients with psychological components to their pain presentation. And I wanted to ask with people with functional limitation due to previous injuries, how do you overcome the fear avoidance associated with their dysfunction when trying to incorporate active care? So we've been addressing these questions from day one, and this is what we're gonna to continue to do today. Another question that came up, and these came up in the very first webinar from, from Maria in, uh, in Wales, how to adjust people's beliefs and, and give them value in these, these virtual consultations. The problem in the United Kingdom is people love passive care. I think this is a worldwide problem. Who doesn't want a, a good uh, massage? I'm paying, I'm paying you, you gotta help me is what I'm struggling with in everyday practice. So how do we approach this in, in rehabilitation? So there's a lot of people who think, well, you should give people what they want and slide the pill into the applesauce, then you give them what they need. That winds up in many cases being called homework. Um, I think Mackenzie had it right. When a person is in the, in the acute state, um, if you show them what to do for themselves, that's, that's game changing. Confidence is the cornerstone of great performance, according to Michael Gervais, and it comes from one place, what people say to themselves. If you get people out of pain, they ain't gonna be saying to themselves that I can do this, that I can handle the ups and downs. So we've seen this um, on Twitter. Many folk are deeply upset about digital musculoskeletal care because they genuinely think that they deliver essential disease-modifying medicines with their hands, needles, and machines. We do. And I don't think that telehealth is saying otherwise. Um, I don't think the self-care model is saying otherwise. But we know that the highest value of care is what we can show people to do for themselves. That we've known since the 1980s, the, the earliest guidelines, which were disseminated, have said chronically that reassurance and reactivation are the most robust forms of management. Now, our challenge and our failure is, is knowledge translation. We haven't successfully been able to de-implement the current types of practices and therefore implement the best practices. Christian Barton, the great expert, uh, says uh, on Twitter, we've offered telehealth for a while. It's hugely valuable. There are advantages, setting up home exercise program in people's homes, the convenience, and now helping slow the spread of the pandemic. I suspect this will change physio practice in the long term. I believe it will. I'm seeing in my own practice, and I'm a, just a chiropractor doing rehab, but uh, people enjoy not having to schlep on the freeways in Los Angeles. 
Uh, they enjoy working from their home. There are people that aren't going back to their work or if they go back, they're not going back five days a week. Uh, so we can connect with people in their homes in the comfort of their homes. So in terms of, of making these changes, obviously it's very, very challenging. Uh, there's so many choices out there. There's so much information. Uh, the internet uh, just creates a Dr. Google syndrome and it becomes very hard to separate the wheat from the chaff. Cognitive dissonance, according to Norton and Chambers, who talk about unpacking complexities of the implementation of inappropriate healthcare interventions, say this cognitive dissonance is a barrier towards the implementation because it creates an undesirable state of tension stemming from the discrepancy between one's belief in providing high quality care and the delivery of an inappropriate or even harmful intervention. So we're all victims of our beliefs. And as uh, Stephen Jobs said, we should uh, think outside the box, but that's not such an easy thing. Uh, there are biases. We all have biases. The, the physicist's video that I showed that talked about we should be prepared to test our theories robustly and we want them to fail. We want them to fail quickly so we can find something that's, that's less fragile sooner. Uh, do we hold our own mindset, our own practice habits that we've been successful with, mind you, um, do we hold them too closely and are we not using humility to question ourselves, to learn? Are we not accepting what Rachel Balkovec called the failure tolerance mindset, where we want things to fail so that we can learn from those failures and grow? This is the, the hum humility approach to be able to always keep growing. When we target complex ailments with silver bullet pharmaceuticals, we don't address the underlying systems level problems. We see this with COVID-19. Now we're starting to see people learn to play, place people prone and the um, early need uh, when people get off the respirators uh, for rehab. Medicine will evolve by recognizing the complexity of the body and pursuing complex interventions. So the idea that we can just correlate um, degree of tissue damage with symptoms as Lorimer Mosley has debunked, this is a simplistic model or the idea that the bio is the most important thing or as, as um, Maria, will, Maria will talk about, this idea that everything has to do with the medical diagnosis. Uh, in the functional sphere, a person's environment and the individual themselves are at least as important as the bio. So it really is a bio psychosocial thing and it's everything in between. We can pretend learning is simple and have a correspondingly simple pedagogy, or we can recognize it's not and explore all of the rich possibilities. So this is really um, the approach for the future. As Alvin Toffler said, the futurist, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who can't read and write, but those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. So here we have this incredible special opportunity to share with you in this uh, uh, long form. We now see illiterate people can go on YouTube and learn advanced subjects that they could never have learned in school. As Jordan Peterson says, in 20 years, people may look back at today and say the way we communicate, the way we learn on television, cable TV, sitcoms, CNN, it'll, it'll be like smoke signals. But here we are with the constraint of COVID and we're diving deep. And we have these incredible guests to bring with us to speak about a subject which, which my mom, who's 91 years old, and to all the moms out there, uh, happy Mother's Day. Uh, please give your moms uh, warm hugs and kisses. Uh, thank them for <laughs> letting you join us today if you're not with them right now. Uh, but here I am with my mom, who's 91, and I think she, um, really has an incredibly uh, crisp way of, of illuminating the challenge in front of us. She said quite simply, and I shared this uh, all over the world, but in China, I think it went over best. She said to me a few years ago, if you want to move, you got to move. And that very simple, iconic phrase, if you want to move, you got to move. That's not what is being said. Doctors are telling people, 
let pain be your guide. If it hurts, don't do it. So we're correlating symptoms with pain. We're correlating scans with pain. But we know that people are not that fragile. We know that people can adapt. And we make them more fragile when we teach them to be overly protective. Overprotection is the number one thing that Laura Mosley speaks about. And what does it create? It creates under preparation. So the combination of overprotection and under, under preparation, these drive the chronic pain cycle. They drive the disability epidemic. And they're the reason why we need to reassure and reactivate people so they become less protective and more prepared. So this is the self-care revolution, but it's been with us for a long time. My other mentor from Prague, Dr. Kara Levitt said, rehabilitation is to show a patient what they can do for themselves. And he wrote the book called, called Manipulative Therapy in Rehabilitation of the Locomotor System. And yet he says, rehab is to show a person what they can do for themselves. I remember in around 1990, after the Berlin Wall fell, I brought a group there a few months later, and he asked us, he quizzed us, he goes, what is rehab? And I didn't know the answer, but I, I thought I would just say rehab is active care. And he, and he said, right, rehab is active care. But now we realize rehab is self-care. Active care is too much Batman, too much motor control, too much corrective exercises, which in its, in its own way, is a ball and chain for people. Self-management focuses on a person's ability to manage their own condition rather than treatment centered on a healthcare professional. The aim is to restore autonomy to the patient and include educational or learning components to position the patient at the center of their own management process and help them acquire and maintain competencies to enable them to efficiently manage their condition, and I would say resilient, resiliently manage their condition, which Paolo will be talking about. So autonomy is a key thing here. We wanna give people positive experience with movement. We wanna give them tangible hope and an achievable plan. It's about our empathy, connecting with them, relating with them, and also our compassion to show them the road. So specifically, if we drill in, Building self-efficacy is where the rubber hits the road. And this is the belief that somebody can succeed in a task. If a person does not have confidence that they can succeed in, in valued life activities, then it doesn't matter that we corrected a dysfunction. So Paula, I know uh, you've been, you're listening to all this and I don't wanna leave you on the sidelines too long, but one of the things about your work um, that just blows my mind is you are so clear about the importance of thinking about the valued life activities of your patient, of their tasks, and not being mesmerized by the, the different uh, kinetic synergies that we create uh, that are almost artificial because the person is on the ground, they're doing things where we're breaking things into parts under the grand illusion that somehow it's all gonna be recapitulated and available to the person, not only in their, in their tasks, in their daily life, but in situations where they're under stress, in unpredictable situations. So can you just speak for a minute about back when you were um, writing, um, uh, with your, your great colleague, um, um, Daniela. And can you explain, Paola, how it was you pivoted from thinking that all these motor control exercises were the thing, were the bomb, to realizing that we needed to focus more on the environment where the tasks took place? Um, the, 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 I guess the short story is that during even my PT training, and I'm Brazilian, so my PT training was there, when I was taking my first class on development and I was exposed to Easter Thielen's work on uh, kids' reflexes. I don't know if everybody is uh, familiar with that, but if you get a baby on their first few weeks and you hold them up and you make their little feet touch the ground, their little feet 
start moving in a gait-like pattern that looks a lot like the mature pattern of walking that you and I produce when we move around the environment. Uh, after a few weeks, this reflex disappears. And because we're very organism-centered when thinking about causes, we tended to think, oh, that was a reflex that then was being inhibited by the central nervous system because of maturation. So it goes away, and then a new, more mature pattern, more voluntary pattern will come around. Except that this is just not true. So Easter Thielen came around and said, hmm, maybe there is something more to it. If there is a growth of this baby in terms of mat, you know, fat that's outpacing the growth in terms of muscular forces, maybe this is the reason why the reflex is going away. The reflex in big quotes, the, the little gait pattern is going away. And she, you know, she made a couple of very smart and clever experiments, which you know, in, one, in one of them, what she did was to you know, dress these babies with uh, little pants where she could put some weights on. And without the little pants, the babies would produce the gait. As soon as she put the weight on, it would disappear. And then she did something else too. She got babies whose reflexes have gone away. They did not show the little walking pattern and put them on the bathtub where, you know, the weight of the body got reduced and there the pattern is again. And then that blew my mind as an undergrad. I was, I don't know, 19 years old. And I was thinking this Cartesian way of thinking that we go from some little pieces to the pattern that we see does not seem to make sense, right? So there is this very close coupling of the context with us in what patterns do emerge. And we have these movement primitives that we put to work to produce functional patterns, right? And over time, we learn how to do that more effectively to create those effects in the environment. So when I went to, uh, I continued my training and that was always in the back of my mind. So every time we were overly controlling of how people moved, that just, just felt wrong to me. And I started studying motor control from a dynamic systems perspective. And then I went to Connecticut to study um, just that, to study perception and action from a dynamic ecological perspective to try and make sense of things, to try to understand this better. And I guess uh, that, that, that journey was what de deconstructed to me every single um, thought that interventions that were too focused only on the individual without considering pretty seriously the interaction between the individual and the environment and that symbiosis right between the two would fail us right and sure enough evidence kept coming up again and again and again showing uh, we're failing we're failing see this is not good we need to move to activity based therapy and of course that comes with its own mysteries and challenges like how do we implement those then right without throwing the baby away with the bathwater, because it's not that the components go away, right? The components are there, they are part of what is uh, contributing to the movement that we see, but how do we harness them in a way that allows people to move effectively across a variety of environments, which uh, brings in the resilience idea, right? How do I prepare that individual to let the environment harness what's within them to produce the outcomes that they intend to produce. Wow. I think that was kind of the journey. I, I, got, I got disturbed by teachers really early about, uh, about um, th this reductionist view, I guess. What was Daniela's influence on you? Daniela? Um, Dani and I were colleagues in Brazil. So we were PT friends. Um, which I was one, one semester ahead of her on an undergrad. And then I went to, so we both got mixed up in this together from the get-go. And then I went to, to Connecticut before her. So when I finished my PhD, that's when she started. So we've been kind of uh, interacting with each other for a long time uh, wow. on, this, on this topic and exploring this together for, for very, very long. I've been um, reading and rereading uh, the paper that the two of you co-authored uh, mm -hmm. for the last couple of years, and it um, really inspired me uh, in in 
making some major changes in the third edition of my book, Rehabilitation of the Spine, um, I tell people, and I, and I mean it, uh, that the second edition uh, was so oriented towards motor control and corrective exercise that people who have it should burn it. I mean, I feel that it's actually the, the wrong message. I don't even feel that it was, um, uh, I know it was a necessary part of my journey, uh, but now I, I can appreciate um, that breaking things down into parts uh, and correcting those parts and assuming that that was going to transfer to sport or activity uh, was, was fool's gold. Um, and this whole em emergence of dynamic systems theory, where we understand the person and the environment and the task and how they're all interacting, um, is, has, has changed the entire way that I perceive um, my role with my patients. So it's all about the environment, creating a fun environment. Uh, like, like Dr. Sue says, it's fun to have fun, but you have to know how. And guiding by the side and not using internal cues and having feedback. So we don't use our words. We, we put um, a, a valve slide or a ball on somebody's back when they're doing a, a plank or uh, a crawling maneuver. And now they learn to control their pillar better. Um, they figure it out, they fail, it's a game, and then they buy in to the growth mindset that Rachel Balkovec talked about. So um, I wanna share with people a little bit more about your background before we go forward. Um, this is uh, just a brief bio uh, for Paula because I know that many of you are probably um, uh, not terribly familiar with, uh, uh, with her and her colleague, uh, uh, Daniela Vaz's work. Uh, but uh, if you email me, I'll send you uh, a number of papers. Um, Paula's uh, primarily dedicated to the scientific study of the coordination and control of human movement with the overarching goal of understanding and promoting human performance. One arm of her research program aims to develop fundamental theory and knowledge about the perceptual motor processes that support the coordination of body movements and their adaptation to task and contextual demands. Her interdisciplinary background in physical therapy and psychology uniquely positions her to pursue this knowledge with an eye on its application and implications to practical problems in rehab and sports medicine. She has leveraged the results of her own research and that of others to develop in the past four years innovative models for promotion of functional performance of individuals with movement-related disability and for injury prevention in sports. The second more applied arm of her research program focuses on the design of innovative technology-based assessment and intervention methods that leverage advanced theoretical knowledge about human performance in the service of relevant public health challenges. So, um, Again, I'm uh, so, 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 so happy to have you with us. And, well, I'm very happy to be here. And to introduce you to uh, people from all over the world. We have uh, uh, Jeff Kubos is here from Alberta, a dear, dear friend and one of the smartest people in the room. Um, Graham Allen from the UK is here as usual. Um, we have people from Panama, Natasha Allen from Scotland, Lampros again from Cyprus. Uh, Belin uh, Bowles from Bolivia is joining us again and, and a, a very special uh, person, a chiropractor in New York City who interviewed me recently. Emily Kibbert is here. Um, Julia uh, Wieldy is here from Switzerland, no doubt, with Tomas Regas. Uh, Kylie is here from South, South Africa. Thank you for coming again, Kylie. Uh, Megan Pomeranski from Winnipeg. Mark Templeton from South Africa. Um, Denise is joining us from Istanbul, Denise and all, um, so many people, Giovanni uh, Fraporti from Italy, um, Jake Joyce from Wales, uh, Walter Brown from Buffalo, somebody we may call on later, uh, uh, an expert himself in some of these areas, uh, Paula, Ian Kaplan is here from Florida, um, Andy Bear is here, we have people from Venezuela, Humberto and Antonio, um, and um, uh, uh, a good friend of mine who's taught with me, Tommaso Baruca, is here. Tommaso, welcome. So 
uh, I know there are more people here. Uh, I don't have a chance to, to uh, call you all out, but uh, we're really grateful for the international audience and I'm so happy, um, I'm so happy, Maria, to be able to introduce you um, to, um, uh, to this, this, this group. So this is something that uh, impressed me a few years ago. Um, and uh, it's from uh, two physical therapists, Harding and Simmons, to increase confidence, patients need to attempt something previously feared, achieve it, and recognize it as their own achievement. Independence and control are fostered by teaching people to self-reinforce and to attribute their gains to themselves. So this is to one of these questions that we started with today um, about why it's good to guide by the side. And, and I think the answer is, is right here in front of us. If people don't fail, if they don't struggle, if they don't accomplish things on their own, if we don't set up the environment that's fun and playful for them to, to do this in a non-threatening way where they feel safe, um, uh, then whatever we teach them isn't going to stick. Um, it's not going to transfer. It's not going to hold up and make them anti-fragile. The next time they have a stress, they're going to forget all about um, how to brace their spine or, or whatever it is. So this has always really been my mission to create an environment in which every person feels valued, inspired, and challenged. Beginning from their first visit, they should leave with renewed energy, tangible hope, and an achievable plan of action. Um, and I think this is a, a crucial part of the whole process of building trust, because in the early stages in rehab, uh, we know that symptoms, the red line, goes up and down. This slide shows eight weeks. It could be longer. Uh, 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 a tendinopathy, according to Christian Thorberg, could be five, six, seven months of up and down. But we can focus on changing things um, functionally that will eventually make the person more resilient. And so how do we get the buy-in? This is always the challenge. How do we get the buy-in? If, if we're offering them cough drops, if we're making them feel better temporarily and then they have a flare, we're doing it with our passive care, um, uh, then of course they're going to opt out. Um, but if we explain to them why it is that we're doing what we're doing, if, we're ex if we explain to them the gap between what they need and what they have, if we show them that, that they have some uh, shortfalls, and they lack certain integrities that we can build up and we start to build those things up. This gives them something to hold on to. These are what Dan Paff calls the, the landmarks of progress. And he says it's, it's not about timelines unless it's a fracture. Most tissue injuries, most musculoskeletal pains, um, the recovery is hard to predict. Laura Mosley was asked a few weeks ago and what was his answer about predicting the future? He says, I don't know when people will get better. In that, he's in, he's in sync with uh, Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein. And Bohr very famously said the most hardest thing, the hardest thing is to predict the future. Einstein didn't like it. Um, he wanted more predictability. He couldn't stand that, but, but, but he accepted it. Um, and so showing people that symptoms may come and go for a time uh, but that we're going to have a plan, and it's, achieve, it's an achievable plan, and it's a safe plan, and explaining why we're building up their squat, why we're building up their hinge, why we're building up their lunge. I have people with knee problems, and they can't get up and down from the floor, and they still have knee problems in life that come on randomly in and out of the car, up and down from bed, putting on their socks, but they're starting to be able to get up and down from the floor better. They're starting to be able to lunge, to get into half kneeling. They see that as progress. That doesn't mean they don't still have uh, their symptoms. Um, Matt, I know that these issues about um, creating trust are very, very important in some of your recent publications, creating this connection with people um, and, you know, we've come to realize that developing this connection has to do with finding out more about the person, the history. And nobody talks about the history. There are so many systems out there, this screen and that screen, this algorithm. Um, 
if they have this finding, then you do this corrective exercise. But whatever happened to the history? For me, the history um, that I learned from Dr. Levitt, also Mark Verstegen talks about it with athletes, uh, of all their key performance indicators, their training history, their, their injury history, their goals, their concerns um, in the patients, uh, their yellow flags, um, this to me establishes relatedness. And when, when the person knows that we are empathetic, then we can actually guide them in a compassionate way. We don't just have to be sympathetic towards them and console them and give them symptomatic relief, but we can actually guide them by the side towards building the robustness um, that Maria is talking about. So can you just talk a little bit about your current thinking, Matt, in regards to the importance of building trust and, and the value of this history? Yeah. Um, so part of me thinks that we are all as healthcare professionals or those uh, who are trying to help others we tend to be very good problem solvers and as problem solvers when we see people sometimes all we see is problems and therefore it comes quite naturally to try to solve those problems for people um, but what we've recognized over many many years is the idea of telling people what to do, identifying the impairments or the problems and then telling them the solutions doesn't really afford particularly good results. Um, and so if you, you, you can look at psychotherapy, you can look at the emergence of motivational interviewing as testimony to that. Um, and so uh, the change in mindset is more to do with acknowledging people first as human beings and acknowledging the human being as the first and foremost principle and then problems second just purely that change in mindset changes the quality the consistency and the genuine curiosity that we that foster in us as human beings to the other people to others and that in itself i think creates a uh, an environment to follow on from Paula's um, uh, fantastic hi history herself, um, create the environment that fosters the relationship. Um, and I think it's that, it's that genuine, it, it's a genuine uh, tendency for, the, for, for us to want to help people, but suppress that because you should, we, I think we should be acknowledging the humanness, the, the nature of humans first, and, and then the rest comes. I love that. The, um, this idea of acknowledging the person first and then the problem. And I think this comes in with the listening. So we've seen the studies, we've talked about how often doctors interrupt. And in motivational interviewing, which you mentioned, and we've talked about, um, the person should be given the opportunity to tell their story. Peter O'Sullivan always starts by asking the person, what, what, tell me your story. If we listen to them intently and let them tell their story in all of its fullness and don't rush the process, I think that acknowledges the person more than anything. And, and it's not just about fixing the problem. I mean, that's sort of a, a male thing. I get into trouble all the time in my family. I'm, I'm always, you know, well, we should do this. <laughs> and I didn't listen. So I love hearing you say that, Matt, because I know I'm guilty of that. And there's so much packed into the, the, the approach, the technique of motivational interviewing, listening, uh, not interrupting. And then when there's the appropriate moment, um, repeating back to the person what you think you heard and asking them if you got it right and then correcting it. And then you know, asking, is there anything else? Is there anything else? I, I allow about 45 minutes for the, for the history. I want to show one of my patients. We've been showing some of the telehealth. This is one of my patients um, who's had this struggle that's shown here on the diagram of symptoms persisting for a long time. He had a, a surgery that didn't go very well um, and has suffered for a long time and is trying to get back to activity now. And it's been a real journey, um, a protracted journey. God, you're looking good. 
Woke up a little early, had some coffee. How, how are you? Feeling good. You look great. Thanks. Yeah, this week was, this week was pretty good. It's the best. It's the best I've felt in a long time. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. It's been, yeah, yeah, it's been like, I, f- I felt like, you know, we were talking about the, the, um, the sort of path to improvement and the strength and pain and that sort of ups and downs thing and then you start to see payoffs a little later and you're like, I'm starting to see the payoffs. So, yeah, it's a, um, it's a funny thing. Sadly, we um, aren't able to predict the timelines yeah. like for yeah. a fracture, but, but we know what the landmarks are. Right. And along the journey, you know, as far as the, the symptoms, symptoms follow a, a different trajectory than function. Yeah. But function is sort of like the, um, the lead guard, the leading edge as you hack your way through. <laughs> Right, right, right. I mean, the path of least resistance, which is an exploration, it's a journey. Um, you're carving out the pathway, and then you know, after the function improves sufficiently, then you start to, to see the, the fruits of your labor, <laughs> literally. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I think going through this process that has been so difficult has made me more and more okay with the frustrating setbacks and flare-ups and things which um can just be so discouraging you know like it's the points where like oh i'm feeling great and then the next week like you know it wasn't a couple weeks ago when i had that morning where i just woke up and like could barely move and there were, were times going going through this when I was just in so much pain and so discouraged by those, like seeing progress, but then having that little step back and just saying, like, oh my God, this is never going to end. <laughs> it's that way, sadly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, routinely, which, you know, everybody wants it just to be a binary snap of the finger. It's like, okay, I do this and then that happens. <laughs> right, right. Right. But I think the more you can get you, you the more you can be okay with that, even though it's not nobody's gonna nobody wants that and nobody wants to feel morning wants to feel um crappy like that, but the more you can be okay with it, then you did. I'm on with Craig. I'm gonna do a session. Yeah. But I'll be down in an hour, okay? All right. Sweet. Um yeah, just the sorry. Idiot working out at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So anyway, it's been I've been feeling good and encouraged, and like feel like pretty good, even you know, despite what's ahead. I feel like I'm on a good path. Shall we start? Yeah. So I'm trying something new. I figured it was so nice out. I would try outside. We have this nice deck here. So. So Matt, uh, I just want to throw it back to you just for a sec. How, when you hear that, how do you, how do how do you feel we can step forward to, even when we go back into the clinics to still focus on creating that mindset of it, it's going to take time um, and it's a journey and create that trust and connect connectedness. Because we're, we're, we're building this connectedness through telehealth. I think it's harder in person because people have the fix it mentality. People yeah. want us to lay our hands on and then they want all the correctives. Yeah, I think, I think drawing attention perhaps to how we as uh, you know, adaptive humans take time to adapt. This isn't something that we're not robots. It's not like something that I can take a piece out of me hold on let's get a new one and put it back in and then as you say it's that 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 fix it quick kind of idea um so i think what you clearly demonstrated there is that you demonstrated a relationship uh you demonstrated some realistic expectations and you gave some clear understanding under the potential potential mechanisms that underpin that so he had some good understanding and you played it at a and it, in a way that that person really understood and took on uh you know he said the words i you know it's difficult for me to accept but i do accept that's just the way it is you know 
Um, so the, the way in which you must have drawn um, from his own history, his own context, maybe something about him um, to convey the idea of adaptive change over time. Um, so it must have really resonated with him. So here you see what we've been working on with, uh, with John. John's uh, left leg is much weaker than his right. And now almost all the tests are about equal. And while he was in severe pain, um, we know that he wasn't using his leg. Uh, strength is lost when, when a COVID patient is in the hospital at a rate of 3 to 7% per day of rest and only improves 0.5 to 1% per day with training. So... Um, I want to throw it to Ryan for a sec. Uh, Ryan, can you talk a little bit about this model of explaining to people um, that um, it's the long game? This is the infinity game. We're not looking for the short wins. Uh, anybody can do fix it manual therapy, and we're happy to do those things as an accessory. Uh, but the main, the main thrust of what we're doing is helping build a foundation, a rock solid foundation that's built to last and not built to, to, to break. Um, how, how, do you, uh, how do you upload that mindset to, to your clients in lower Manhattan? Well, I think uh, it's, it starts with, uh, like you said, just getting to know the person, being able to understand where someone is where they're starting, where they're, uh, what they're able to do right then, but also their beliefs and everything, uh, of their concerns, their goals and the worries. And then being the, the next thing we really do is to just try to get people to, um, see the connection between all the, the, the exercises or activities we're giving someone. Uh, and, and that is a process of onboarding them, the importance of, let's say a squat pattern, a lunge pattern, a hinge pattern. And, um, we show people how this is a term I learned yesterday is that their patterns are low functioning, not uh, dysfunctional. So that, that changes it slightly so that it's a, um, it, it's a spectrum where, uh, it's something that is, is changeable. So in the first session, we show them how, uh, simple exercises that they can do for themselves, uh, can change their situation, empower them, change their beliefs about, uh, what's possible for them and then we lay out the expectations we show them we tell them it takes a long time we tell them the statistics something like this you just showed us that the rate we lose things at is is faster than the weight the the, the rate we gain things at so so we, we lay out the expect expectations that's the long run and we teach um, them not just what the patterns are but how to train them how to um how to make the decisions that we make so that over time they can become independent with the decision making. And uh, of course we'll support them with instruction or whatever it is, but uh, we try to get people uh, independent with, with uh, the long term. We show them the importance of uh, exercise movement and, and re proper rest and recovery for not just uh, their pain. At first it's their pain. Like you said, it's the gift of injury. Uh, but we talk to them about how there's also added benefits of reducing chance for uh, cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, falls, osteoporosis, everything. So um, it's mm. uh, very resilient and uh, to be active and to have a great lifestyle. And, and so we, uh, over time, we, we relate that to their, their goals, their concerns and those worries. And then usually people, uh, they like that story of hope and, and I, we, we guide them along and, and usually we get good results with that. I like that. I, I think the, the title of Professor McGill's book is very wise, The Gift of Injury, because people come in um, wanting to know why they have pain and what are we going to do about their pain and how long is it going to last and what do they have to do? Um, what should they be careful of? What should they avoid? Um, and it turns out that lo and behold, um, the process is one which is actually going to make them younger. We're actually giving them um, something that is more powerful than any pill in terms of preventing future uh, diseases like hypertension or type 2 diabetes or even cancer and will prevent falls and frailty all because they came in with a hip problem um, and we're treating it in an active way rather than in a passive way. Um, so one of the things that was part of the, the pivot for me uh, was uh, brought out in an interview with Emily Kibbard. Uh, 
she asked me um, uh, to talk about uh, Gray Cook's uh, concept of, uh, um, of uh, move well and then move often. And so one of the things I said was, does move well really matter as much as I learned from Professor Yonda or I taught myself or Gray Cook teaches? I would say it doesn't matter as much as the social determinants of health, uh, which is something that Ryan is beginning to, uh, to, to approach uh, very gingerly. Um, you know, lifestyles are one thing, but then the social determinants of health, that's a whole nother thing. Uh, are there green spaces near you, where you live? Is there safe parks for low, in, for low income people? Um, do we have bike paths? Um, uh, the social determinants of health are crucial. Um, this, the absolute tragedy of, of uh, our African American uh, brethren uh, being uh, 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 brutally murdered uh, for just going for a jog. Uh, the social determinants of health between poor and wealthy areas in the United States is in stark contrast um, and a great tragedy in our, in our society. Um, as far as the motor control aspect, um, I'm guilty uh, of training people to overcorrect and I think it makes people fragile. So one of uh, your papers, Paula, is on anti-fragility in sport, leveraging adversity to enhance performance. This is, uh, I think, a crucial mindset for us is to explain to people that we wanna give them some stress. We wanna give them some novelty, uh, some variability that um, we can't simply um, uh, assume that we're gonna put a hot pack on, do a massage, do some low load exercises that are biomechanically correct. We need to stress the system. And I love the quote you start the paper off with from, from Horace. Adversity has the effect of eliciting talents, which in prosperous circumstances would have lain dormant. And in this, in this paper, uh, you show this, this picture. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the implications of this figure? and what this, uh, what this study is about? Yeah, so as uh, with a lot of knowledge that we have in rehab, we're very good sometimes at understanding how to prop up and improve the functioning of component functions. So think about um, muscle. If you wanna increase the strength of a muscle, we're very good at determining for each individual, what load should I stress this muscle with? to improve its strength locally, just of that muscle, right? So I know I don't need to be working at the maximum capacity of that muscle if I try to do you know, one repetition with the maximum uh, load that that person can carry. That's not typically what we need to do to push that muscle to over time be able to withstand larger loads. We can train it just above its optimal, you know, it, we can challenge it, make it, challenging without make, taking it to its limit, right? If you do too little load, then it doesn't develop, it doesn't grow. If you do too much, you may end up straining that muscle. So there is an optimal level that you need to train the person at, right? The thing is how to blow, when, when we start talking about activity level training, we have no idea how to define, we say, oh, we need to challenge them, but how? Is there a methodology, can we ramp it up from component training to performance, the same kind of logic. Can we set up uh, in our testing of our patients a way to measure their performance, which is the y-axis, and vary the complexity of the environment systematically and see how is it that they're responding. So the test that we've been working with um, that we just uh, got a grant to develop is a navigation in, in a complex environment for athletes to start preventing unwanted collisions, which is a very large you know, reason for uh, injury in sports. Not collisions that are intended, but those that they don't see coming for some reason, because they're not attentive enough to their environment. So imagine an individual need, needing to go from one place to another, to a waypoint, as fast as they can while avoiding contact with obstacles. And we're creating this in VR, and we have uh, avatars, which are the opponents, 
that are driven by dynamical models of locomotion that allows them to be responsive to you. So you become some kind of attractor to them such that they try to intersect you. So they're trying to get after you. And we make them do that in different ways. So some of them will only start you know, going after you after you get to a certain range of them. Some of them will, from the get-go, just try to rush and intercept your path. And your goal is to kind of get to your waypoint without colliding with all of these different um, opponents. But we can make that environmental complexity increase systematically, right? So I make you go and there is just one opponent, then I can give two opponents and three opponents and four, and see how your performance goes. So if you start getting four or five opponents in there, and now all of a sudden you're colliding and your time to complete the task becomes way too large, larger than the minimum uh, we give you to do, the, the maximum we give you to do the task, then you say, oh, maybe this is too much to stress the system, right? I need to find, so that blue piece is, you know, the amount of environmental complexity that we would offer that, that participant at the beginning to see if this is sufficient to start promoting growth, right? To start promoting their ability to be attentive to the complexity of, of the environment while performing some um, task that's relevant to them, like meeting a teammate at a waypoint, for example, or getting to a waypoint in a particular time. So that's basically what we're trying to set up. How do we assess um, people's performance under a variety of stress levels? And then you can do that for whatever task you can imagine. This is supposed to be pretty general. So if you're thinking about carrying weight for people with um, back disability, you can think about that x-axis, the environmental complexity, to be you know, boxes of different sizes or boxes of different weights and see how the fitness level changes. And that did, may, not, may not be pain, it could be pain, but it, I would advocate against looking at pain on the y-axis and really looking at how they're recruiting those degrees of freedom under those different conditions, right? So maybe with a low weight, people are able to use their full back in a nice way. All of a sudden, when that weight you know, increases to a certain level, all of a sudden they're bracing, they're not there. You begin to see signs that they're using that restrictive mode of control that we wanna avoid. Maybe you don't go there yet. So you can start stressing them you know, at a lower level than the maximum they can achieve successfully with the hope that we can accomplish over time that desensitization, right? in a way that is very specific to the patient. Mm. So that's what this kind of uh, curve is supposed to indicate. That's what we're trying to do and develop a methodology to systematic assess people, people's resilience, which is basically the area under that curve, like how much environmental complexity can you handle in a particular task? So what you want is to increase the area under that curve over time. Wow. So you wouldn't put pain on, on the axis, but eventually they would become less sensitized. Well, that's the goal. But yeah. I, would not, I would not think um, that pain we target directly, right? To me, that's kind of a byproduct of you using your system more efficiently, right? So, so instead of making it about the pain, Yes. You make it about how is that person using the body in a way that is flexible? Because, you know, I worry about us moving away completely from mechanics. I'm not saying we focus only on that in the mech. You know, I really loved how Matthew talked about it, how Laura Mar talked about it. I mean, the, the mindset of how we think about cause and effect that, you know, for when you have a salient outcome like pain, we want to find a salient cause to that, that we can kind of one-to-one -one linearly correlate the two. That mindset, I think, is killing us, right? That mindset is not good. We know that from many, many evidence out there. However, that does not mean that having a body that can provide many, many options for performing a task and that every time you do the task, you do it a little bit differently because you're able to adapt to the circumstances. That's good stress for your body. If you're using a restrictive mode of control where your goal is simply to prevent a particular movement that you decided will cause you pain and harm, that's a whole different way of organizing your movement. And you might be actually localizing the stress too much on certain places. And then you might lose mobility on other places that when you, you try and move in that way or accidentally you 
can't control and a particular stress happens, that stress is interpreted by your brain as, ooh, that's too much here, right? Because your tissues are changing. The way the, the stress is spreading through your body is changing. So the inputs are changing too. And they are part of the story. They're not all of it, but they're part of the story potentially, right? And then, of course, you know, the way you're, you're controlling your body will have a huge impact on how stresses are distributed. I think if you're controlling your body in a way that, you know, makes available a family of solutions for task performance that, you know, your body selects according to context, that's a healthy mode of control that we should strive for instead of a mode of control that's restrictive, that you're just using one thing, one way of moving. So the evidence is like very clear that, you know, staying in one position for the whole day is bad for you. Rest is bad for you right? So you want a variety of stresses in your body, right? So that's, that's what I think the functional mode of control can actually get you when you're not, you're, you have to yield control to the environment, basically, to the constraints in the environment, instead of you trying to decide which movement you're going to use, because your goal is really not to feel pain, right? So that's kind of the shift that we're trying to create with the, with the types of interventions we're proposing with the help of technology. So when people are, are anti-fragile, then they have more options. They have more options. That's right. So that's why I think when we say, you know, manual therapy, let's throw it out of the window because it's passive. If you're doing manual therapy to make degrees of freedom available that the patient no longer has, if you're getting a movement, a motion back that is not available for that system to recruit and not it is available, that's another degree of freedom in the game to be used, right? When they're performing different tasks. And that may become important under certain conditions. That if you don't have that degree of, that particular degree of freedom and the particular circumstance is pushing it out of you, but it's not getting in, the kinds of inputs and feelings that you get might be interpreted as pain. Um, and over time you become, you know, even more responsive to those inputs. That's what, that's what pain research has been showing, right? The same stimulus can blow up in terms of the response. It's not linear, the relationship between the two. And even after noxious input goes away, that doesn't mean that you stop responding to, to that, right? Over Correct. time. Yeah, as an amputee would show. Yes, yes. So this is fascinating to me that you're... Um, taking in Talib's work. And we talked about uh, Talib's work with Lorimer Mosley, and he yeah. talked in a similar language as you about finding the sweet spot. Mm -hmm. uh, not too much and not too little. Not too little. Varying stressors. So uh, we have the flexibility in, in your language. And I love what you're saying about this uh, human desire for there to be a one-to-one -one relationship between these are your symptoms and here is the cause. And the patients want us to tell them the cause uh, and they want to know the solution. They want that to be one-to-one -one. and us as healthcare us professionals. Everybody. Yeah. We get seduced by that. We get blinders on um, uh, Matt. I wonder if you can comment for a second about uh, how this just makes us a hostage of mm -hmm. this linear thinking when in reality we're dealing with complex systems. Yeah, absolutely. I, Paula, that was amazing. Thank you for that. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to kind of respond, uh, thinking about open and, and dynamic systems. So when it comes to open dynamic systems, we know that um, certain, you know, we can't causality, the nature of causality in open systems are going to be nonlinear. Uh, and this talks to exactly what you're describing. What I was really interested in as well was the idea of changing the things that you can change so the ecological the environmental context what i was also interested in is is perhaps allostasis uh, of the individual uh, of which you can't necessarily change some of those stressors um so we, we're describing stresses and stress related factors um of which we could let's say compartmentalize just for the future for, for discussion about cognition psychological so cognitive flexibility psychological flexibility physical capability um and how we start to because what you're really appealing to here is the idea of where the limits are in terms of what's too much and what's not enough 
And so we have to potentially think about what are the capabilities of the person, not just from, physical, from a physical perspective, from an allostatic modeling. Um, and I'll be interested in how you perhaps view that and how you could respond to that. But what I really love about what you were saying is looking at the environmental context and looking at the number of degrees of freedom as the, as the variables that you can tailor to that individual, depending on the allostatic components. So you can titrate the, the stressors, the things that you can control potentially, and through a therapeutic context, the patient can control. Um, which then increases the self-efficacy, which has been, which takes us right to the, to the beginning of, of, of our talk today. I, I'd be interested in what your thoughts are on allostatic modeling. Um, I don't know much about that. My focus is more on the movement and, 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 and the actual motor performance. But what I want to react to here is that I do not think that cognitive components like self-efficacy, you can talk people into having them that's why education is tricky sometimes and i really loved how laura Mar was talking about this we need to it's not just oh let's educate because here here is one thing that really touched me on that on that uh, webinar that you both were there uh matthew and um laura Mar mostly where you said there is this thing that you know evidence tells us that this is what we should tell patients to do we should tell them not to take rest that they should be reactivated and they should not be afraid of movement because that's not going to harm them. But that conflict, that, 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 that set of interventions make no sense to them, right? Because of the belief that there is pain related to uh, harm. If I'm feeling harm, then it's because of pain, right? And then, you know, it's interesting to see the work of Peter Stuhl where he says, you know, this is built up not in a vacuum, those beliefs. Those beliefs are because you have these lived experiences throughout your life since you're a kid. You see harm, you see your knee bleeding when you fall and that comes with pain, right? So you can't simply talk people out of it. We're gonna have to promote self-efficacy through interventions that will pump them to trust themselves, basically trust their bodies in responding to stress in ways that are um, successful, right? So they will do it, they'll feel a little pain, Tomorrow I'm not worse because of it. Maybe I'm feeling the same, but you know, that didn't make me worse. That didn't make me uh, feel more pain than before. That's not making me dysfunctional. So over time, right, that, that, that belief is being dismantled through the experience of this. So I become more self, I start believing that my body can do things because I'm doing them and I'm accomplishing them. Not because you told me to, and I'm not saying that talking to them is not important. I think it is important, very important. And, and, and the thing with complex systems is that complex systems are weird, right? I, I really love examples from <laughs> development. It is, it is, I mean, development changed my, my, as I began with Easter Thielen, those weird findings. But there's more weird findings if you look at the uh, work of uh, Gottlieb, that is a is a developmentalist that works with a transactional model that thinks that, you know, we should not be thinking of outcomes of development as a product of genes alone. It is fully interactive. It's not genes plus environment either. It's interactive, bi-directional interactions between all levels of the system. And then what that does is that salient causes not always can be tracked back to salient, sorry, salient effects cannot be always tracked back to salient causes. So I'll give you one example that blew my mind as a student. This is well-researched over and over again, replicated, not just weird one-off finding. There are things that we call instinct. For example, when a duck is born without any training, without ever having heard the alarm call of a mother before, when the little duck, duckling hear that alarm call, it freezes. No learning. So that, that never happened before, the duck never saw any other duck doing that before, first exposition, boom. So what is this? Oh, it's encoded in the gene, right? Of course, it's instinct, it's nature, right? The nature-nurture kind of debate. But what Gottlieb begins to show is that if you devocalize the little duck when it's inside the egg, such that the little duck cannot hear its own vocalization, not the mommy's, because his ear is fine, he cannot hear, the little duck cannot hear its own vocalizations. 
turns out the duck is born and doesn't respond to the maternal call. It's weird relationship between this subtle experiences that we don't find a logical relationship to the effect. But somehow, if you don't get that one experience, your system is not harnessed in a way that will allow you to express that species typical behavior. Now, the beautiful thing too about complex systems is the flexibility. Okay, you didn't hear your own vocalizations, but then you're re reared with little other ducks where you hear their vocalizations, oh yeah, then you can respond to your mom again. So there are multiple pathways to get to the same thing, right? So those, so I think, you know, patients should be exposed to those narratives too, that, you know, what they're feeling, even though we can't find a, a salient cause to it, even though people are saying, oh, we find nothing on your x-ray, that means it's here. No, not necessarily. There are subtle changes to your body, that is making your brain act in ways that are not helpful to you and to explore your body, you know. And that happens, subtle causations that are not in x-rays. They're not salient causes. So I think that is helpful to change the mindset, but I don't think that's sufficient either. I think the self-efficacy will come through exposition and successes through that exposition, right? And the thing is that we need science there because we have no idea how to figure out what that optimal level of stress is. We don't have tests that push people because we're just after finding that normal pattern. Oh, it's abnormal, so let's fix it, right? So we don't have a situation where we're letting people respond under various levels of stress that will allow us to kind of create that curve and see what the adaptability looks like, right? Under, under stress. So I don't know if I answered your question, and I think if I didn't completely, it's because I don't know enough of that level. I'm more focused on the motor pieces, but I don't think cognition is out of it. I don't think self-efficacy is out of all of that talk. Wow. Paola, that, uh, uh, that underscores some of the work of Annie O'Connor, whose uh, book, World of Hurt, talks about violating the person's expectation that hurt equals harm. So that's the exposition I think you're referring to where we create an environment with graded exposures to feared stimuli, mm -hmm. and we violate their expectation that hurt equals harm because the next day, even if they're not better, they're not worse, they didn't break. So, so we're debunking the idea that they're fragile. We're changing the whole, um, the whole story that, oh, you're broken, you have a narrow spinal canal, you have to avoid this, or you have to, to, to uh, uh, do this specific thing. We want to we want to inculcate what you're what I'm hearing you say the the flexibility. We want to mm -hmm. discover that we're less fragile, and that's part of the journey towards becoming anti fragile. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think you know we, exposition therapy has has worked not great so far, but it has some positive effects better than placebo. But what I think, and that's, I think we should use psychologists to help us with that, with that piece. But what I really think is that we need ways of activating the patient and exposing them in ways that are um, helping them recruit the degrees of freedom that are available to them. And I don't think mere exposition does that, right? Mere exposition that psychologists can do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think is good, but I don't think, I think we can still contribute. And maybe this is me being attached to my own profession. And of course, I'll be open if evidence begins to show that, nope, it does the same if you do it your way versus just the psychologist exposing. Um, but I do believe that there are ways that we can expose them to particular patterns of movements that they are afraid of, but we believe it's a degree of freedom that's important. In back pain, for example, they don't want to flex that spine, right? They don't use the, the what they call the hip strategy. It's not used enough. People are, they're, they're taking away that degree of freedom. I think it's useful to help them get that back and exploit that um, and expose them to that particular thing that's not being functional. If it can be recovered, if not, then exposition is all we can, we can do. But if you have a degree of freedom that can be recovered, and back to the, and get get it back to the game. Why not? 
why not do that, right? And have, and have that available to your system to harness when you're doing things. It's not that I, I'll never try and tell people, oh, when you pick up a box, you have to use this. But we can create exercises that recruit that degree of freedom and be creative about it. And I think biofeedback technology uh, and the way that some colleagues and, and I are working on is great because you can map the particular movement that you were intending the patient to do to simple stimuli in your field of view. And VR is great for that, right? So my, my colleagues, I collaborate with them, but they developed that for ACL. When you're squatting, you try to take or, you know, try to improve form because form is important for stresses in the ligament. So you don't want them to valgus too much when they land. You don't want them to use too much strength forward. So you want to exercise them on that good form. And that's sort of icky because if we're giving them seven, eight instructions about how to squat, now we're doing the, let's focus on the micro, which we know it's not good for learning, chokes them when they're under stress. We don't want to do that. So what did we do instead? Well, they're wearing a, a, a headset where they see a little square. In each corner of the square and some other points in the square are moved by biomechanical parameters that we think are important in squatting. So we tell participants, for example, our participants in our study, you know, squat so as to preserve a square. If you're squatting and it's kind of changing shape, that means it's not good. Find a way to squat so that you create that square there. And that's how we control movements from a dynamical perspective, right? What do we do? We move so as to create perceptual effects that are meaningful to us, that, you know, that's telling us we're getting our test done, right? So we're trying to let them just discover that form. And in that respect, we help them recruit quadriceps so that when they're jumping, they don't need to count only on internal rotation to dissipate all the load, right? I hope they can have the quadriceps to use too. And sure, if they're jumping and there are people around, they might do the valgus in the field, but that's okay because that was needed at that point. But hopefully they will use other forms as well that are less stressful because they don't need to turn in because the quads are good, right? So you want to try and just give them what they can have in terms of, of resources so that those can be brought into play for a system that's fully engaged and not trying to pick up the form cognitively, right? As they're moving around their field of play. I think mm -hmm. that's kind of the goal. Um, you're, guiding by, you're guiding by the side with VR. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a kind of exposition that I think <clears throat> we as PTs, as athletic trainers, can do that special, right? Because we, we know about the body, we know the resources that are important, for you to have a variety of possibilities for landing, not just one, right? I like so, that. So, so it's not like, let's throw away everything we know about the body and just let everybody go to the psychologist now to get graded exposition. I don't think so. I think, I don't, I may be wrong, like I'm saying, I think we need testing for this. And I'm open to being wrong all the time. That's why I'm a scientist. I put these things to test, right? <laughs> to see, is this helpful at all, right? in addition to just exposition to movement period that anybody can do. And I, and I am betting that this may, it makes sense at least theoretically that if you have more resources to pick from, your body will come up with a variety of solutions and then the kinds of stresses that you're gonna receive will be healthier. It will not be located on only one structure, one set of structures. It will be better distributed. Paolo, we have, we have a question. Um, Aaron, do you want to uh, share the question from Kylie in South Africa? Yep, we got it right here. Um, let me pull that up for you. Here we go. Uh, could we use uh, HRV as well as AI to correlate environmental and physical factors to better predict resilience to tasks? Could we use what? Can you repeat the question? It says, could we use uh, HRV as well as AI to correlate environmental factors? Well, we, we've been, we've, uh, you know, th this particular project that I'm developing with my colleague, Adam Kiefer, and we have uh, an engineering involved, Dr. Kelly Cohen from at UC too, 
who is an expert in AI. And what we're trying to do is to see if AI can actually pick out the types of behaviors that athletes display when they're doing those navigation tasks that would say, hmm, if they're displaying these behaviors, that predicts that they are going to have a good performance. So if they begin to fail in exhibiting those behaviors and that we're measuring things at multiple levels from eye tracking to see what they're attending in the environment, all the way down to biomechanical variables and um, stress based on, on, on sweat measures and stuff. So we're measuring different things to see under what conditions of training can AI tell us, oh, this person is better we can pull out the things that predict better performance under this level of stress, right? And now let's train them there. And then it keeps updating the model and it keeps saying, oh, now it's time to move on because, you know, this stress is not harnessing those responses anymore. Now we're seeing a stabilization of performance. So we want to use AI in the context of those tasks in that way. And also, you know, as a way to stress participants more. So our virtual opponents can get more or less information about where you're going to go and we can predict that during AI to make sure they then begin to work as very good opponents. You know how athletes can predict what other others are going to do and they act proactively to impede your progress. So we want our avatars to do that kind of thing and we're using AI to promote that, to really push our athletes to be attentive to their environment, to train being attentive to the environment, being coupled to it perceptually, not cognitively, but perceptually, because if they don't, they're going to bump. And yes, there's no cost on the bumping because those are virtual characters. So they can, they don't need to be afraid that they're going to get hurt because it's a bunch of ghosts, right? But they can explore their capability of it. And they get, you know, you get really engaged in these things because you're unencumbered. It's all wireless stuff and you get into the, the field, and I've tried it myself, you want to win. You don't want, you know, you want to get to the waypoint and w- before the ball does so you can kick it, right? So you're trying to do that, and sometimes you're so, in, so focused on that goal that you bump because you didn't see somebody coming to intercept you. And that unintended collision is bad for performance. So yes, we want to use AI to, to kind of help us identify what's the level of stress that would be better uh, for pulling out behaviors that correlate with uh, better performance and safe performance um, in complex environments. Paola, what are, what are you showing here with these two graphs? So these two graphs were just uh, trying to illustrate that if you go and you measure and you assess your patient, if you look at the x-axis, let's say at the low levels of stress, You can look at two patients and they may look exactly the same to you. Oh, they're responding pretty well. They look the same. But as you stress more and more, you can see how athlete B, as you stress them more, it somehow, it pulls out behavior from them that's helping them improve performance under stress and the other is not able to do that, right? So you have an area under the curve that's better for athlete B than athlete A. And for those of you that are, you know, biomechanical, people. That's what we do for testing stress strain of tendons and ligaments. If you think about tissue biomechanics, that's what we're trying to accomplish here. We're trying to do stress strain testing at the level of behavior. And we know that for tissue, it doesn't matter if you can reach a particular very high peak of resistance. The idea is, can you, can you, is the tissue flexible enough to extend in a way that preserves some resistance, such that the area under the curve is large of the stress strain curve. And that's what determines how much energy can that tissue withstand before breaking, not the peak of performance. So it doesn't matter the peak, mm. it's how well you can sustain it across stress levels. If people are really well adapted for one thing, and that's what I think when you push for a particular form, that's what you're accomplishing, you're making them very good at one thing. But is this what gives you resilience in performance, right? And we know from research in in motor behavior, the basic research in motor behavior, because I think that's my specialty really, that that's, that what gives you resilience when you're very good at a task, you don't do the task the same way every time, even under very contrived experimental conditions. If I'm telling you to over and over again, hit a chisel with a hammer, 
the trajectories that you're going to produce at every movement was going to be slightly different every time. That's what experts do. They're not getting the same movement over and over again the same. And then that's what we try to make our patients do somehow. And it, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, it's not what gives you resilience. It makes you good at that movement. That's it. Matt, do you want to, uh, <laughs> you want to comment here? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, what you're saying makes so much sense. Um, so what, what you're effectively doing for me personally is bringing the motor control, motor behavior, motor learning uh, context into the clinic. So you're essentially looking at the wide variety of affordances and you're making most use of the affordances associated with the environment. And you're using that as a, a way in which you are creating appropriate levels of stresses, uh, encouraging variation, variability to uh, enhance one's ability to adapt. Um, so it really does kind of, I think, probably asks us as clinicians a lot of difficult questions about what we're doing in practice uh, when we're looking at uh, repeated uh, you know exercises done in the same way um, uh, yeah it, 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 it give, it's given me a lot to think about <laughs> can i just complete one, one one small thing please i really think though that we need to be if you're doing the repeated exercise to get your quadriceps up to speed because you want that component to be in the game of all the possible components can, that can be harnessed for a task. That's okay, right? In my view. Yeah. It's harmful when you decide that to perform a given task, now to carry that box, this is how you should do that. And then the person, every time that sees a box, is now worried about the back. And now it's worried about producing a particular pattern yeah. that then what you're doing is taking away degrees of freedom that would allow that person to adapt. Mm. And what we see in that box effectively. Yeah, so do you see we... how that's different than yeah. saying, oh, let's get rid of all repetition. We know that to get a muscle strong, you need to repeat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. that's fine, right? And, and that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying is don't over instruct the person on yeah. daily practices when you're doing activity level training embrace it let the person let, what we need the challenge i think for us there is what's the level of stress that the person can handle to have a good experience about effectively using their body to accomplish the task right that's that's what's crucial yeah. at that point you're not telling her don't do this with your back don't do that with your back do this look look ahead look this if you start doing that in the context of functioning, you're taking away the, the use of the body that's most typical. When our body's functioning, functioning skillfully, we're not thinking about how we're gonna move our ankle, how we're gonna move our knee. When I wake up in the morning, I say, oh, I need to go and make my breakfast. When I'm getting out of the bed, I'm not thinking, oh, let me think about where my back. As soon as I feel pain, that will be my natural reaction already. We can't reinforce that because we know that that's bad. And I think by giving so many instructions, mm. when we're doing activity level training, it's problematic. Because I think we're reinforcing that mindset that's already the natural thing to develop under those conditions. And of course, the person who's fragile, they have a keen appetite for somebody telling them what's right and what's wrong, which, yep. which feeds the problem. Yep. So you're teaching us just to be more disciplined because even the expert, when they throw darts, everyone is a little different. Because mm -hmm. the environment, mean, the environment is never the same. The stress is never exactly. the same. Exactly. The environment is never the same. When we say normal pattern, I mean, I, I, there are things like kicking. If you look at sports trainers, they are going to tell you the best biomechanical kick, you know, rotates the trunk and that's, you know, put some energy into the trunk that you can release during the kick so you don't use only the leg. So there is this biomechanical form that's ideal. Now look at kicks that actual top-notch athletes actually do in the field when they're scoring. I mean, they're all contorted. I mean, there's no repetition, no two kicks 
in the field of play are going to be the same ever right so we need to calm down about you know making them do this particular form for the sake of optimizing performance if you want to practice a particular form for the sake of giving that individual degrees of freedom resources to be harnessed when they are in a particular environment sure go for it right sometimes that's needed but don't overdo the importance of the form because effective performance in the wild does not look like a repetition of pattern that's not what it looks like right that's great i think we have another question along these same lines i've i've uh unmuted anna marie anna marie from england do you have a question uh thank for us very much thank you very much welcome um um, first of all, thank you very much for the amazing, amazing clinical pearls that you are throwing out there, especially the self-efficacy will come to exposure. I love that. Absolutely love that. So movement variability, what would you give priority in clinical, in clinical setting to movement variability or variability or load management to create that? anti-fragile state to create the adaptation to chaos, adaptation to stress. Paola? I'm trying to, to, to wrap my head around the question. So you're asking for a very practical advice here, right? So how, how I would, what I would do to harness variability? Is that what you're asking? Yes. So what would, would you give uh, movement variability as would you give priority to movement variability or would you give priority to load management variability? What would, you, what would it be your, uh, your strategy if I want to increase someone's um, adaptation to stress? So I'm going to say based on theory because we, yes. that's stuff that we don't know very much. Mm -hmm. But reasoning through theory... I would say both and both would accomplish different things. So sometimes using movement variability is your way to providing that system with options, different resources to be harnessed during um, functional performance. When you're training activity lab, so when you're training components, you want to vary the patterns when you're exercising, right? So if you're, I don't know, if you are doing a lunge, you don't need to do a lunge just straight every time. You can turn as a way to do torsional stresses at the same time. I mean, you can vary the, the pattern of movement as a way to recruit different components to do that exercise. So your training component, you want to vary the, the pattern of movement pretty much actively. You're trying to reduce that variability. But when I'm training activity level, I don't want to mess with that. I, would, I just want to let these things naturally emerge because if I start, and then I, I moderate the load in that case, then I play with the load when I'm doing functional training to see how that patient is able to recruit the degrees of freedom that I'm trying to make it, to make available to him or her, right? So it's no guarantee that if you get your quadriceps up to speed in strengthening, that that's going to be used when they jump. You have to actually practice jumping in many ways with different loads to try and produce that recruitment. I, I ask because I'm always quite worried that uh, increasing variability of movement sometimes might give the client, the person, different strategies away from where they have to strengthen. So I'm worried that they will then use those as preferred strategies because the original movement pattern might not have... Uh, there is might not be enough strength. So that's why I'm asking. No, that makes sense. I mean, one of the yeah. things that I see over and over in my research on the different tasks is that, for example, individuals with um, ACL injury or individuals with low back pain or individuals with cerebral palsy, when you have them do a task under different conditions, it's striking how less variability they show in the movement sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have, if you're an athlete, that has risk, high risk for ACL, when you land, you're going to tend to land every time with the valgus. So I'm not saying practice the valgus. That's not what I'm saying at all. But when, they are, when you're practicing landing with them, that's not the time to say, careful with 
care for the valgus. <laughs> That's not the time because then you're going to push your focus to the micro components of the movement, right? So the biofeedback that we're, you know, that my colleague, I, I'm part of the team, but the, the people that are leading this development is Mike Riley and uh, Greg Meyer. That Mike Riley is my colleague at, at my department. Greg Meyer is at Children's Hospital. That biofeedback that they're developing is to practice the, the, a good form for squatting and landing but without ever telling them any instructions about how they should do that, right? They just have to produce the square. So you're practicing the good form, but they are free to decide how they're gonna work with their body to produce that square. There are many ways you can squat to, and, and have lower valgus loading, and you, you let them discover that, guided by the, the, the visual feedback. Thank you. So I agree with you that you know, you don't want to reinforce patterns that are already the one they have. You want to increase the, the degrees of freedom available. That's the point. So if there is one that they already do and do well, there is no need to push that pattern, right? Yeah. Thank you. Paula, you, you remind me of a quote from Boo Shagnatter, a great sprint coach from Baton Rouge, Louisiana at LSU, who says, diversity is the injury protection guardian. Mm, I love that. And what I'm hearing from you is it's also a performance enhancer. <laughs> so yes. we don't just think of stress to build robustness uh, and adaptation in the elements, like the muscles, the components uh, to, to enhance performance, uh, but also variability since in reality, environments are always changing, especially like a, a, a game like soccer where there's, it's so complex, so many different players. Mm -hmm. Golf may be a little different because uh, mm -hmm. many times they may have a flat lie and it's just the person and the ball. Uh, mm -hmm. There it may be more the mental and what you said before, the variability helps you handle choking. So mm -hmm. we need these things. But I wanted to share a quote from uh, uh, Nirit Rotem from Israel. Motor learning, please don't correct movement. Instead, encourage creativity and new movement task solutions. Um, uh, don't be the instructor telling someone how they should move. Less control by us and more guided exploration if needed by the learner. Um, I, so, Nick, so I wanted to ask you to, to comment on this. So Nick, I, I think that that's completely in line with what I am saying, but I'm not a trainer, right? So I'm not the best person to be answering this question. Nick, on the how, he has such creative solutions to push the athlete to explore options without focusing, the, the language he likes to use, which is great, focusing on the micro, right? So he doesn't want people to focus on the nitty gritty details of the movement because he knows that that hampers learning and performance. So he as a coach educates the athlete's intention. What should I try to feel when I do this? Mm -hmm. Because when I feel that, that should constrain me, right? That should harness my, my interactions with the environment. And he uses instructions for that too, which is fine, right? I'm not saying no instructions at all here. It's just we need to be careful about the types of instructions that are helpful. And then Nick has many ideas. And he also, it seems, I mean, I heard him yesterday. He's open to testing. I mean, we don't know. <laughs> but, he, you know, it makes sense. It, it, it's coherent with the th theoretical knowledge that we know about the movement system that providing instructions is a way to harness your movement system. But we need to be careful about what instructions that we're giving, such that we're not taking away the creativity, the potential for varying how we're doing things to protect ourselves, right? To protect our bodies. And I go from the presupposition that our biological movement system is pretty smart. So when you say value the individual, I say that at a very concrete level too. Think about as an example, and you can shut me up if I'm talking too much. Can I give this one example? <laughs> Go. Um, children with uh, cerebral palsy, they walk pretty much like we run. They jump on top of the foot that has the, what we call the spasticity. And we try to say, oh, this person needs to touch the, the heel on the ground. But the reason the system found that solution is pretty amazing because they are bad at generating force 
but they're pretty damn good at conserving energy because their tendons are long and stiff. So by jumping on top of the foot, they're actually conserving the energy the best. So what your neural system does is exploit the resources you have. Does that mean I don't try to give the cerebral palsy child more resources? No, I try to give them more resources. What I don't try to do is to make them walk in a way that I think is normal because I think their brain is smart enough to sense the resources that are available given a child wanting to do a task. If I want to propel my, if I want to move forward in space, my body has resources and my brain is good at harnessing them. That's, that, that's the point, right? So you want to give people resources, but we want to let figure out ways through instruction, through constraints to harness those resources the best that, we, that, that the, the person can, not the way I think they should. Paola, would you speak briefly about the, uh, this graph here from your paper on um, climbing? climbing athletes yeah so this is the climbers it's very interesting i was in prague recently and we have some world world renowned climbers there um and looking at your study um obviously you can manipulate uh the targets mm -hmm. and make things easier or harder uh by challenging them to take different routes so um i was curious to hear how you're applying that so this is interesting because adam Kiefer and i started with this idea of ant fragility and this way of creating these response curves. And we presented this work at, at a conference in Barcelona, Complex Systems in Sports. And Yannick Hill and his advisor, Rude, um, from the Netherlands, heard our talk and then they contacted us. We want to try and do this with climbers. And that was their attempt. I mean, I have no specializations in, 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 in climbing itself, but what they did they try to create response curves, have athletes go through routes, climbing routes of different difficulties. And he created individualized curves for these athletes as a way to then say, here's the optimal training for this athlete, which is different from that athlete because of how they're responding to stress. Hmm. It was just a way, our initial attempt to apply this. And now they're doing it with rowers too, as a way to figure out you know, what the behaviors are, they're telling us, oh, this is the level of stress that's good for this particular individual. So I wanted to show a video here of a person I'm working with who's got a lot of impairment in their shoulder, a lot of pain bilaterally. Uh, they have some um, uh, long history in competitive sports. Uh, from Chile as a uh, triathlete, also elite cyclist, um, qualified for the Tour de France, Iron, Ironman competitor. Um, but now, um, after doing two years of, of high-level bodybuilding in Las Vegas, her shoulders have become extremely painful. So if we do the FMS shoulder mobility screen, for example, uh, there's tremendous pain and restriction of mobility. Um, We've been working with uh, uh, Pavel Satsaline in different loaded exercises, but she hasn't tolerated the load at all. So uh, we were doing a session together uh, in her home gym, and then we decided to go outside because her property is unbelievable. And we came upon a hill. And in my way of thinking as an environment, there is no better way to get hip power than a hill sprint. And I knew that if we got the hip power, um, that the rest would follow, even if it didn't start off in the most coordinated way. Um, so just to check this out, just as an experiment, we did this. We're gonna go hips to lips, fast as you can. Faster, faster, faster. Oh yeah. Now, scratch your back. Aha, uh -huh. switch. Okay. Now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hip power loosens the shoulder. We need the arms moving in the socket. Make sense? Yes. You're a fucking genius. No. <laughs> the body is. <laughs> so the the you said it before. Uh, uh, you said it before that um, we don't know the 
child with cerebral palsy figures out solutions. The smartest person in the room, Anna Hartman says, is the person's own muscles. So we create the environment. We try different tasks. This is just not the psychological graded exposure to feared stimuli or quota-based therapy. We're thinking biomechanically, aren't, aren't we, Paula? I think you're uh, unmuted. Sorry. I would go. say yes, that that's what we bring to the table during our way of exposing, right? Our way of exposing is very specific and our knowledge I think is helpful until we were proven, if we're proven wrong, then that's a shame, that's pity. We'll think differently. Um, but that's okay. Other solutions, but that's okay. But yeah. I think we should, I think that's, that's where research is needed for the applied scientists, right? So to really test us on this, because it's a theoretical assumption that this would be the case. Now we need to see what the evidence is. Would we get better results that way, right? So in the spirit of uh, guiding by the side, uh, Nick Winkleman shared this on his Twitter, uh, Harjeev Singh, couple things on verbal feedback. Reducing feedback frequency enhances learning. Delaying feedback is beneficial. Um, uh, concurrent feedback is not effective. And asking learners to estimate their own errors is effective. Um, I found this list to be very, very, uh, uh, very thought provoking. And, and uh, I never would have seen this if it wasn't for Nick's recommendation. Um, but packed in here, these ideas on uh, less is more, um, even delaying the feedback, um, and then asking learners to estimate their own errors is effective. Um, uh, Matt, I'm curious for, from your perspective, uh, how that, how, that it, you, how you transcribe that into building that, that relationship or that bond with the person to empower them. Um, wow. Okay, I'm still processing a lot of what Paul has said. Um, so, is the question that you're asking about? Sorry, you'll have to repeat the, the question. Final bullet: asking learners to estimate their own errors. So, so oh yes, asking yeah, a person yeah. to be doing yeah, like sorry. the child with CP, they figured things out. The mm. athlete uses different um, strategies all the time. Um, when a we put a person in a novel situation, we're using variability, we're changing the environment, changing the task. Um, we see what works and doesn't work. It's nice to debrief. I know Dan Paff talks about this a lot. Uh, we always want to ask the person, did that feel um, uh, better? Did that feel worse? Did yeah, that yeah. give you different ideas for how to solve the problem? Did you feel more vulnerable or less vulnerable? Mm. Yeah, I think it's this idea of, of um, as uh, uh, it's, it's no different to how we are in practice as clinicians, the ability to reflect, the ability to look on your own experiences and be honest with yourself is a, one of the best things that we can do when we learn and we uh, we, we support others. Um, so if it's, you know, it's no different with you, uh, if it's applied in the clinical context with, with, a, with a person who, who you're doing rehabilitation with, is to ask them to, to reflect on how that's gone, how it felt. So we've got, and I, and I do think that, um, oh yes, we may have some biomechanical type of knowledge. I'm going back to Paula's point, but also I think we use psychologically informed practice re regardless of you know, whether or not necessarily we're trained in it. And it's um, having that, that, that relationship with a person who trusts you, who, who gives permission for them to, to be able to reflect and, on their own experiences really consolidates the learning process. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, we have somebody else in, in the room that I wanted to ask if they would uh, uh, maybe um, ask a final question for, uh, for Paula. Um, Ian, are you still with us, Ian Kaplan? Yep, I'm here. Yeah, so here. Ian's a young uh, person immersed in constraints-based motor learning and uh, this perception action coupling. Um, do you, you've been listening through uh, these webinars and today with, uh, with our guests, um, a lot of people uh, would be wondering about uh, the relative roles of uh, creating uh, an optimal exercise uh, versus in a way this idea of in the end, the person is gonna be, to using Paula's term, they're gonna be in the wild. Mm -hmm. so, so is there a question 
uh, that you'd like to ask from, from your background about how we can bridge the gap to make people more resilient? How would you ask the question? I would ask the question of, I imagine the scale of, of controlled environment versus uncontrolled environment. And I, I go back to some of the constraints led approach stuff um, that really comes from field sports. My background is in field sports and it makes much more sense to me to organize a practice environment around, you know, to, to nudge people towards specific skills that you want them to pick up in their environment. Um, with our language around training, that's kind of, it's harder because it seems like there's a narrower, you know, a narrow set of constraints. Um, my challenge is with communicating that to either athletes or, or people like looking to coach athletes as to how do we, this is like, I guess, from the communication perspective, like how do we get, get, you know, introduce the intent to practice exercise as if it were um, an environment that's preparing them for the wild, right? That it's a, it, it's a, it's a representative environment and not some sort of different context where there's rules about, you know, uh, quality versus, or, you know, right, quality, qualities of good versus bad. Um, that all of a sudden you're in an environment of parts versus holes, right? It's the same person, you know, and it's, and it's the, the context needs to be translatable, but there's some sort of baggage that comes with being in a gym or in a clinic that changes the way mm -hmm. people perceive their rules. Um, I guess the, the way to phrase the question is what, um, what sort of tools or practices have you developed or have you come across some of that resistance as to frame the training environment as an extension of, of practice or as a representative environment to, to solve problems in. Paula, did you That's get that? for me. That's a challenging yeah. question. Yeah. So I, I, I <laughs> it, there's so, no, that's okay. There's so much insight in your, in your question itself. And mm -hmm. because I am not a trainer, I, I am not, I, I don't have a practice. Yeah. So I'm not the best person. I, I'm not facing these challenges head on, right? And right. I'm just so grateful that for the first time, I mean, that paper that Craig really liked yeah. on human movement science, we submitted that paper to probably about five or six clinical journals. They didn't even send to reviewers because they didn't think that was interesting. Wow. Because theory, who cares, right? So I am just so grateful to be able to interact. And I was listening to those podcasts and over and over again, I heard people saying we're stuck because there is evidence, but how we understand things don't match up with that evidence. And that's creating a problem for application, mm -hmm. right? So it's creating a gap that theory could save us from understanding, you know, causation in, you know, in different ways and really taking away the Cartesian reasoning and putting in place complex system reasoning um, could help us. Now, the challenge you're facing is now we need to communicate that, right? Yeah, so I feel um, that we as, as the, 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 the scientists of the, the theory, when we write papers, we need to get better at communicating these concepts that are sometimes so philosophical and hard in ways that could help our, our partners in crime, like clinicians like yourselves that are trying to use this, give you the language, the examples, the that would allow that discussion to happen in a fruitful way because it's not easy to nudge. It's not easy to nudge, but like Matthew said, and I think also Lorimar, we need to reflect on why am I pulled to this? Why am I so attracted to this? Why, why, why? Like really reflecting back, we get stuck in our own ways all the time. So it's not easy to nudge people out of ways that have worked for some time. It's in it, it, the other thing, you have to put things in place. So my work with the development of biofeedback is to be able to tell people, you know, clinicians, I know you know that you can't give too many instructions, but here's what you can do instead, right? Because if you just tell them, don't do this, don't do that, but you have nothing in place to tell them, oh, you can use this thing instead. And as you know, VR technology gets cheaper, you can set this up in your living room. And it can provide the, the, you know, thinking of telehealth, it can provide the trainer, the PT with progress reports 
because depending on how well they're matching up that shape that you created according to parameters that you want them to achieve, you know how to progress them from being away. You don't need to be there. So they're taking ownership of their practice, but you're there. You're setting it up. You're setting up the parameters in the game in a way that you know, allows you to track their progress. So I think I feel that my goal is to think creatively with the theory. See, from, from reasoning this way, what kind of practices can come up that I can you know, propose and start testing so that clinicians have things to put in place of what they do? Because I've been a clinician myself, and sometimes it's hard. You know something perhaps don't work, but you just don't know what to do instead. But I think the time is in our advantage now because a lot of you are proposing things that can be done and have been done successfully to, to, to put things in place of what we have done. So many creative things in this webinar I've, I've heard. That is great, right? So it's people harnessing understanding, theoretical understanding to come up with solutions because I just think what doesn't work is just criticizing and pointing fingers. I that's think that's beautiful. Lorimar's point. With the, with the Lancet paper, yeah. he was concerned because mm -hmm. it was finger pointing. Yes. When, when it's really hard, it's not that they're wrong. They're absolutely right. It's an amazing uh, set of researchers telling us, you know, what the evidence is showing. But on the clinician side, the challenge is of a different kind. How do I convince my patient that this is the case? How do I convince myself? Exactly. That, you know, that this makes sense, right? And that's not addressed in the Lancet papers. It's the elephant in the room. Uh, education it's the elephant is, not, in the room. is not simple. And, and to your point about bridging this gap from our training, our theory to our training to the wild, um, next week when we return with Rachel Balkovec, she deals with hitters in baseball where you have the only sport in the world where, where two athletes are both at the limit of human performance one throwing a baseball 100 miles an hour and another having to react faster than the blink of an eye to decide whether it's the crazy. ball has spin, is moving, is breaking, is a strike, is a ball, what type of on it. And, and her, her dive of late has been in the connections between the subcortical, because it's not cortical, and the eyes and how we can train these people so that they're better prepared in the wild to handle that. So um, we don't have the answers, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, and we started today with three big issues about um, uh, clinicians um, uh, uh, and our beliefs about how much to correct. And we, we've learned so much today from both of you. I wanna thank you both, uh, uh, Matt and, and Paula, for opening our minds to uh, kind of keeping an open mind to the fact that um, we need to bridge the gap, but there's so much we don't know, and we should be very, very fluid with respect to not overcorrecting and using variability as much as possible. And that, that goes back to the individual, not making them overprotective, something that you said over and over again, uh, Paula, not telling them there's only one way, that makes them feel fragile, um, and giving them that confidence that, that um, uh, that they have this uh, inherent resilience um, to bounce back. It's, it's, it's not a gloom and doom situation. The pathology is not a, a sentence for people. It's not a verdict. It's just a description. It's important. The bio is important. Um, but we can create these environments that help people uh, through these exposures um, to regain some of their uh, self, of uh, their self-worth, um, uh, that they can engage in whatever activities they are. And we need to learn from our patients, from our athletes, about how they move. Your story about the child with CP um, is absolutely uh, blows my mind uh, that you just observed. It was like what Louis Pasteur says, there's a lot you can learn by observation. If we just observe, we will learn. But if we have blinders on, then we can't observe. Um, so uh, Paula, I wanna thank you. Um, uh, Matt, I want to thank you, um, thank you, our audience all over the world. We still have uh, 138 people that are with us. Um, I want to thank you on Mother's Day. We should all um, go and uh, uh, call our mothers, uh, hug mm -hmm. our mothers, kiss our mothers. 
uh, and also all those people that are social distancing, all the elderly people, all the people suffering uh, in the hospitals, uh, if we can reach out uh, to send love their way um, through this uh, uh, transitional period we are in now where we start to venture back, but, but not everybody is venturing back. So um, we'll see you next week with Rachel. And again, I want to thank everybody for coming and especially our guests, Matthew and Paula. Thank you very, thank very, you. very much. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, everyone.